Thank you, thank you. I'm not exactly certain which year I was actually a Humboldt Fellow. I've been told it was 1995, and at the end of the talk I have a bunch of pictures from 1995 and 1982 and 86 and things. Um, I, I, when I, uh, my work these days largely focuses on uh, statistical methods in epidemiology and nutritional epidemiology, uh, genetic epidemiology, radiation epidemiology, and some molecular biology. But I was, I was, I, I thought that would, well, Wolfgang said this would not be a good topic to, to speak here at a finance conference. So I thought I'd go back to uh, an old friend, and that's the single index models, and, and talk about a, a new model and, uh, of at fitting specific, specific kind of single index models with some interactions. And where did it go? Uh, luckily, just uh, the day before I left, Wolfgang was kind enough to send a new paper of his called Generalized Single Index Models, the Estimating Function Approach. So unfortunately, I only got this on Wednesday, so I wasn't able to write a paper about, oh well. And this is joint with uh, uh, Naishin Wong, who used to be at Texas A&M and is now at Michigan, and my student Yehua Li, who's at, at Georgia. And so there's Yehua, and uh, there's Naishin. Naishin's visited here, I think, once and uh, a long time ago. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, basically three things. I, I want to generalize the single index model to allow for low dimensional interactions. I want to quantify the cost of estimating principal components in terms of uh, asymptotic distributions. And I want to do a, a data set which is pretty complex and is dear, dear to my heart. Uh, it happens to be a biology data set, but that's uh, neither here nor there. Um, and, and what I'll do is I'll outline the regular single index uh, the standard FDA model, functional data analysis model. I'll allow for low dimensional interactions. I'll show you the procedure. I'll state the results when basis functions are known. And I'll state the results when the basis functions are estimated. Do a little simulation and then uh, do a data analysis and then have a, uh, a photo gallery at the end. All right. So. Um, some of the basic models, uh, of course, are, are ordinary non-parametric regression with a link function, which is at the start here. Oh, I have a little gig. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then there's the the generalized partially linear model, uh, which is uh, a partially linear model with a link function. There's the single index model, the, and the the paper that I remember starting this was by Stoker and Herdler back in the 80s. And this is partly why I'm giving this talk, is I get to quote a couple of Herdler's papers. And then finally, uh, well not sort of finally, uh, Jen Cheng Fan and Irina Geibels and Matt Wan and I wrote a paper called the Generalized Partially Linear Single Index Model. And so that combines the two previous models. There's the, uh, oh there it is. That it's, it's partially linear, but there's the single index, and the link function is, is the generalized version of that. That actually is in the top five, the paper that we, we wrote. This is the first paper I wrote with Jen Cheng. We wrote one just recently with Aurora de Legle. Uh, this paper has well over 225 citations. And so I really was kind of sad to write the second paper with Jen Cheng because it means that our average number of citations per paper is going to go way down. Um, Okay, so the, the data structure, and these data structures arise in all sorts of contexts. I have a scalar response. I've got a longitudinal covariate over either time or structure on 0, 1 with a mean function, uh, mu sub x. So the, each individual contributes a, a longitudinal covariate. I don't actually get to see the longitudinal covariate. I get to see it corrupted by white noise. And then I have some fixed covariates, a vector of fixed covariates, z sub i, which include an intercept. And what my goal is, is to relate the scalar response to the longitudinal covariate and the uh, vector covariates, z. 
And, and what the, the standard functional data analysis model says that the, the way, this, the, in, the, in the additive case, that the way this works is that you, you take a weighted average of the underlying latent um, longitudinal process, and that weighted average is a function depending on t. And so this is a, this is a linear model, uh, but there is a function here with weight. So, I'm going to start with the simplest case that the, the functional process is entirely observed and then go, go on to more complicated processes. So a standard model for that functional process is a basis function expansion. And here I've got p basis functions that are orthonormal and I, I'll say that the, 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 the um, parameter there is the parametric function there is a linear function of the basis functions. And then if I, if I do that and I define uh, uh, the, these excise here, I've got a, uh, a nice deep, nice simple framework if I, uh, that in point of fact the, the integral I'm interested in is linear in these uh, Will, will be general later eigenvalues, but whatever they are in, the, in these uh, uh, components xi. So that reduces, if, if I know the, um, if, I know, if I see x everywhere, this reduces the problem quite a bit. Uh, the, the only issue then becomes how do I, I um, how do I decide upon the basis functions? And there's two ways of doing that. One is to just decide upon the basis functions and be done with it. And the other is to try and estimate the basis functions. They have data-driven basis functions. And I'll talk about both, both ways for doing that. All right. Well, okay, so if I, if I know the basis functions, I assume that u of t is linear in the basis functions, then I, I, do, I get out the excise, and then what I'm left with is simply, a, that gives me a nice simple linear model. And so the, it, if I were able to just write out basis functions, then I'd now go back to least squares and it would all be, it would all be wonderful. Okay. Well, I'm not interested in the, the additive model. What I want to do is add some interactions between the longitudinal covariate process and the covariate z. And, and in my example, that's a natural thing to do. In, in my example, um, is, well, we'll see, see it later, but it, it's thought that there has to be some interactions between the two. And so it's a natural thing to try. And the simplest thing to do is to go from the, the basis, fun basis function approach Keep the basis functions, but now instead of having a fixed alpha, let alpha depend on a subset of the covariates, the, the, the vector covariates z. And this could be z without the intercept, it could be just some subcomponents. And then I, what I want to do is in, in case z1 has lots of dimensions, in order to avoid curses of dimensionality. I'm going to take a linear function of the, the, the uh, z's here and, and that's a single index. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm estimate, what I want to do is, is have a model where the, the covariate, the uh, parameter, if you will, is, has basis functions and then it has a single index a partial, a linear single index framework. So uh, when I go through the calculations on that, I get the following model that y is these eigenvalues here times an additive single index model plus a, uh, a, a, an additive model in the z's. And what's not known is the function s, so that's, it's a single index with an unknown function. Uh, it's, it's pretty close to what uh, Jen Chang and I did long ago. In fact, this is very, very close to what Wolfgang did long ago. Uh, there are various things needed for identifiability, which uh, I, I'm going to skip over those details, but there they are. So that's a simple model, a really simple model if I know the basis functions. And I can generalize that to make it a generalized uh, partially linear single index models with interactions by adding a link function and the usual device is quasi-likelihood where you pretend that uh, the, the mean and variance of the response given the predictors is 
simply parameterized in, in, uh, with a mu and a v. There can be extra parameters here. But that, that's, that would work for logistic regression, which is um, one of our examples as well. So that's the model. And uh, the there's a couple of questions. If the basis functions are, the first question is if the basis functions are known, in other words, if these excise, if, if I can observe the basis functions are known, I can observe x, and hence I can compute xi, uh, how, do, how do I estimate? Uh, the parameters and also the, the single index function. And the second question is what happens if I don't get to see x and what happens if I don't know the basis functions? I'm not willing to assume I know the basis functions. So um, that's going to be relaxed. So here we go. Uh, well, I just want to point out how close this thing is to the generalized partially linear single index model. I, you know, in a long, let's see. A long, long time ago in a universe far, far away, I couldn't resist. And uh, so you can see how close this is. The only difference is that I've got these excis floating around, so the, these, these things here. So it's very, very, you, you can almost think, well, I'll just take this paper here of Wolfgang's or uh, the paper that I did with Chen Chang and Irina and Matt and, and just go uh, cracking through that. And, and that's certainly possible to do. Uh, we, we, we went after, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Part of the problem is that there is a constraint on theta that its norm has to be equal to one or else there's no identifiability. And, and that constraint can be handled in lots of ways. It can be handled in an ad hoc way or you can do a polar coordinate representation. I, so even sitting in an airport, I could work out six different algorithms to try and, and fit such a model, uh, some more uh, involved than others. Profile, semi-parametric profile likelihood is, is uh, an obvious way to do it. And another way, now paying homage to uh, Wolfgang and, the, and his crew, is the MAVE method of Zhao and Herdler in 2006. And the MAVE idea is really a computational idea. The, 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 this model is very simple to write out theory about and, and all that, but there is actually some computational issues. And, and in our original procedure, Matt Wan did the programming and, and really had a lot of trouble with profile likelihood and keeping it stable. The, the MAVE method is, is, was, was proposed as a way of making the computations easier. And it, it's simply a two-stage approach. You first try and get an initial estimate of theta, and, and it's Z1 transpose theta is, is the argument to the non-parametric function. So if I knew theta, this would be a trivial, trivial uh, thing to fit. So what I want to do is get this single index into one dimension. So I, I get an initial estimate of theta, and then I do local quasi-likelihood uh, from, from there. And they're both local quasi-likelihoods, but the initial stage in the MAVE procedure is a full multivariate kernel weights followed by a univariate kernel weights on the, on the single index. And so it works basically like this. For any z, if I want to estimate the function s of z transpose theta, I fix all the parameters and its derivative s uh, superscript 1. Then I'm going to minimize the, the quasi-likelihood function my, with multivariate kernel weights, uh, which are the usual multivariate kernel weights. And then, after I've done that, I'm going to update the parameters by, now I've got an estimate of theta, and I'm going to update the parameters by just uh, fixing the, the, uh, the function estimate and its derivative, and then maximizing this quasi-likelihood, local quasi-likelihood, in all the parameters. A fairly simple, that's a very simple task to do. So both are fairly simple tasks. And then finally, after I've gotten a, an initial estimate of theta, I'm going to go and use univariate weights based on the single index in the obvious way, z transpose theta and zj transpose theta. And I'll do a iterative maximization of the function and um, the, the uh, parameters by minimizing that, that quantity, update theta and continue. The, the, in the algorithm, theta is fixed here and the only th everything else is estimated, get a new theta, etc. So it's a, a simple quasi-likelihood, iterative backfitting type of method. It's not a profile likelihood uh, approach. 
Okay, and and uh, I I won't do the details, but uh, the the uh, the estimated function, the function S, has the same bias variance decomposition that you, we all know and love. Uh, the parameters are estimated at root n rate. They're asymptotically normal, and they have. Uh, uh, a uh, covariance matrix, which is pretty much what you would expect. It's a little bit trickier because there is a constraint that theta has norm one, but what you, you get is exactly what you expect to get. It, you, it's a semi-parametric efficient procedure. So that, that's really good, and, and it, it's, it, it works. The, the computation is really nice, but th somehow it's unsatisfactory for a couple of reasons. One, the very, the, the use of, of particular basis functions, well, there's lots of different basis functions to choose, so the question of which basis function to choose. And in addition, we don't actually see the longitudinal process. I, in my example, I don't see the longitudinal process at all. Uh, and so the, the usual way to get around that to try and estimate the basis functions is to use functional principal components. And this, is, this, this old idea says that if I write out the covariance function of x, uh, and these arguments S and T as an infinite sum, then X can its, itself can be written as its overall mean, which should be mu X, plus an infinite sum of basis functions and, and eigenvalues. And, and so that's a rep, that is fairly close to a representation of what I've done. It's just that there, there are basis functions. And how are those basis functions formed? Let's hope I've got them in here. Uh, well, I don't. I'll talk about how to get the basis function. So there are basis functions that have this infinite expansion. Joel talked about this yesterday uh, with, with lots and lots of basis functions and, and how the eigenvalues get smaller and smaller. Well, and, uh, the variances here, uh, the WJs, get smaller and smaller and smaller as you add more and more components. And they get smaller in my example very, very quickly. And so I, 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 I'm sure there are many more complicated examples where they don't get small quickly, but my, my experience is that it, it, uh, there's bound to be cases in finance and uh, in higher dimensional uh, data where, where the number of basis functions is large, but in, in the kind of data sets that I deal with it, if I'd be I'm lucky to get three principal components and, and ha quite happy to have three because it makes for a more complicated picture than just two or, or one. So we don't observe the uh, covariate process and we don't, in, in my examples, we don't observe the covariate process with noise everywhere. We, we observe it on a, uh, a set of values in, in the interval between zero and one and we've got this white noise process. So I've now got to estimate the, the covariance function of, of uh, x. So what, what we do here is we, we punt the problem that Joel spent a lot of time on yesterday. Uh, that is, we just fix the number of principal components uh, to a reasonable number, a finite number. and We don't attempt to get full uh, efficiency, uh, a full consistency, non-parametric consistency. We just do the first few of them. Uh, this often, this is often what's usually done in practice. Really, is to to look at the uh, the variances, uh, the uh, w's, the, the omega, sorry, and and then see when they fall apart or when you explain 99% of the variability. So to to push this through, you have to estimate the covariance surface, and the means real easy. Any garden variety smoother will do. Um, for theory, we use local linear, but in real life, we use splines. Um, we need to estimate the, the, the product of x. That's easy enough to do. You just need to make sure that you don't, you get rid of the nugget effect. So you, you use terms, you don't do wij times wij because uh, that, that has an extra, uh, the sigma squared u shows up. So uh, you, you get rid of the nugget effect by only using uh, discordant pairs. And you can estimate that bivariate function by bivariate whatever 
method you work, and then you get the covariance surface. And so these things are well known. This is well trod territory of, of estimating the covariance surface. And then uh, you can also estimate the, the parameter sigma squared u, the, the measurement error variance, by subtracting it from, estimate the variance function of the w's, and then subtract the, the uh, the, 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 the variance of the x's and then average it over the, the values of t's, which is basically what it's done. So these last few slides have, are very standard in the literature. Um, and then we have to estimate the PC scores. The, the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions are estimated by an eigen decomposition of the covariance surface. And we have now estimate, have to estimate the, the PC scores because we don't get to, uh, which is given by this formula, but we don't get to see x everywhere. We don't get to see x at all, and we only see it on a finite number of points. And in that, in that uh, framework, there's a, a literature on estimating uh, the the scores here. Uh, there's the PACE method of Yao and, and the numerical integration method of Muir, Hans Muir. Uh, that, again, trotting old grounds. Uh, the, it turns out that the PACE method and, and the numerical integration method in our simulations and examples work effectively the same way. The numerical integration method is easier, and it's basically what, what it is. It's, it's a numerical integration. T is on 0 to 1, and so the usual, the, the obvious numerical integration uh, method is this. So uh, that gives us our estimates of these scores. And that's pretty cool. And so you, you've got your basic model. We substitute now. We've gone through all this trouble to estimate the scores, estimate the excise. And it seems to me blindingly obvious that, that if you go through all that trouble, I went through all that trouble, it would have been easier to say you get the estimates by a usual method. But there's at least three nonparametric regressions floating around. There's a bivariate nonparametric regression floating around. And I don't know. You don't have to really have much insight to think that there's probably an effect for doing all of that stuff somewhere in, the, in, in uh, terms of variances of parameters that you're interested in. Um, and and I, I use the word blindingly obvious because while it's not very well known, in the Bayesian world, people are doing this stuff in the Bayesian world, and they're doing a side construction of the principal component, uh, the, the scores, the excise, and then plugging them in as if there's no uncertainty about the, the excise. There's absolutely no uncertainty, and then they run through the whole Bayesian machinery and get wonderful answers. And I, I, you know, it makes me a little nervous to just do this side calculation when I've done three nonparametric regressions, including a bivariate nonparametric regression, to get to, the, get to this mess. Okay, so under certain ter technical conditions, basically we have to have an increasing number of observations per subject. Uh, the, the principal component score estimation doesn't impact the variability of the nonparametric function. It has exactly the same distribution as if they were known. It does increase the variability of the parameter estimates. It, 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 there is an extra component. It strictly increases the variability. Estimating the principal component scores strictly increases the variability of the parameter estimates. And that, that uh, is, 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 I think, OK, well, it does. Theoretically, it, it does. And the question is, when does it do it? And how, how important is it? But at least it, 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 it it fits with what I would have thought. I mean, it's blindingly obvious that you do a bunch of side calculations, you're going to increase the variance of parametric components, and, and that's, that's certainly true. So I'll do one simulation. There's a million simulations that you can do. This is a pretty simple one. It's somewhat based on our data. And uh, there's a, I'm going to generate a Gaussian longitudinal process in X, which is uh, basically has a mean which is quadratic. The covariance uh, function of the process has two principal components, psi 1 and psi 2. I've given there the eigenvalues are 1 and, and 0.6. That's not really like my data. The 0.6 is pretty high. Uh, 30 observations on each curve randomly generated on the unit interval uh, and then contaminated with uh, Zero mean noise with standard deviation, what is that, 0.3, or variance, 0.1. And this is, this is the, the, the model. I then add uh, noise to y. I've got uh, the, um, bivariate 
uh, Z1 and uh, add an intercept. And let's see, they're, they're uh, uniform on 0, 1. And the function is a sine bump function. Uh, this is the same sine bump function that uh, Xincheng and I used. And uh, I've done 100, sample size of 100 with 30 observations per subject and repeated the simulation a number of times. And I've got parameters. It's, it's all this blah, blah stuff. And, and what it seemed to me has to happen here is that the beta term is going to, there's going to be very little impact on the asymptotic variance of beta due to estimating the principal component scores because it lives over by itself. And that's, that's, that's what happens. We get about a, a 10 to 15 percent increase in variance for the beta. I think it's going to do the same thing. My intuition was it was going to say, do the same thing for theta because that's also kind of outside the game. And, and we get about a 10 percent variance in inflation for theta. But it, the, my intuition was where all the, all the increase in, in variance has to be is here in alpha 1 and, and somewhat in alpha 2. And there we get variance inflations of 25 percent. Well, that's not so much, but 725 percent, 260 percent, and 250 percent. Well, those are pretty big variance inflations for parameters that aren't near zero. And, and that was, that's the point, is that basically uh, this, is, this was not a carefully constructed thing. It was the, the first thing we tried. But there are situations where ignoring the basis function construction can lead to wonderfully precise standard errors, uh, which are much more precise than, than they really should be. Um, and, and as you'd expect, if you uh, ignore the interaction, which I built into the simulation, then all sorts of bad things happen to the parameters as well. Okay. And, um, I don't, I don't live in an econometric world, so in, a, in statistics world, 45 minutes is the maximum that anybody will tolerate or they start leaving the room. I don't, I don't know if that's quite true, but so you're getting the 45-minute the version uh, of, of this talk. And that's all I've got. I, I can't imagine speaking for more than that, um, and I won't even get that far. So there, th this is this data set uh, that I want to talk about. Okay, I, I agree it's not finance, but it's really quite an interesting data set, and it's 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 real complicated data set because it there's a lot there's a lot of biology known, and 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 I, I think it's sort of interesting to talk to biologists who are intrinsically non-numeric. Uh, now, th there's a new brand of biologists coming out that does bioinformatics, et cetera, and they're all involved in this, but, but intrinsically, this, they don't think like we do. They think in terms of stories and patterns that they put together in a big gestalt. And, and they do experiments, and, and some of the experiments are really, 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 really expensive. Rats have to be housed in cages. And there's all sorts of rules about how you house rats and where they can live and how nice you have to be to them. And, and they, they hire graduate students not to organize conferences, but to take care of the rats. So, so in fact, the rats are more expensive than the graduate students are. It's just, it's just true. And, and there's a lot that goes on. They're spent, they're up in the middle of the night. And so these data sets tend, when you're actually dealing with mammals, the data sets aren't massive because rats cost a lot of money. You don't, I mean, you can go out and buy a little rat, that's okay, but it's the feed, care and feeding of the rat that costs a lot of money. So what I've got is a, a data set where I've got 12 uh, rats that were assigned to two diet groups and, and uh, two treatment groups. It's, it's, uh, that's right, I have 12 rats. Um, and each rat, oops, each rat's in, injected with a carcinogen and sacrificed 24 hours after the injection. So this is an immediate response to an extremely potent carcinogen. And what they do is they excise the colon and they go and look at a biomarker 
which is called P27. And P27 is important in the cell cycle. And, and if you do bad things to P27, like drop P27, then it's going to impact the cell cycle in a bad way. And so you, you, you need to have some P27 in your, in, in your body. So you don't want that to go down much. Um, and the data come, where's the functional part of it? The data come from the way they measure things and what the colon looks like. Uh, I think I have a picture here. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a view of the colon. A side, they cut it, they just cut it, side, well, they cut into it. And the colon is endowed with these little structures, which are called crypts. And the cells, and the cells are along the wall. They're not in the middle, pretty much. The cell, these are baby cells. These are stem cells, which everybody's all excited about in the United States and experimenting on stem cells and da da da. And, and as the cells get older, they migrate up the crypts, and then they're eventually exfoliated. So I'm going to measure cells at the bottom. I'm going to get proliferating cells here, differentiating cells here. And, and so there is a real, you can think of this as age, an age on the interval 0 to 1, or time on the interval 0 to 1. So I'm going to get data. My X, my P27, is measured on every cell on the left side of each crypt. Uh, there's another crypt there. The, the graduate students in biology, first of all, have to get these images, and then they have to go and read off what is the intensity of that, that, that stain for each and every cell. And, and it's not done in an automatic process. So you can imagine, and then create an Excel file. So it's a lot of work for these poor kids to, uh, to do this. Um, we've sampled about 20 observations, 20 crypts from each of the 12 rats. So a total of about, uh, it's actually a total of 249 crypts. Right. So that's X. And, and X is measured exactly as I said. It's, me it's not measured continuously because the cells are discrete units. There, there is noise. It's not, there's a lot of noise in the measurements from cell to cell. So it's exactly what well, I get to see Y, uh, W, I don't get to see X. And what I'm interested in is how P27 relates to cell death, program cell death. Your, your cells die all the time. This is good. And, and um, if you have a damaged cell, you want it to kill itself. It's, it, it, so cells need to commit suicide uh, if they're damaged. And so what we, this is what we want to understand is how the P27 relates to uh, program cell death and also uh, the environmental variables, which are diet and treatment, and the proliferation rate in each crypt. Proliferation is, that, that's bad when you've got a tumor and cells start proliferating and you end up with a metastatic tumor. And it has to be, it has to be that the P27 interacts with the environmental variables. It just, it just has to be. It's the whole, that it's the whole point of their research is that their additive models don't fit data. They don't want additive models to fit data because then they don't learn anything. They, they don't understand what's going on in, in terms of the basic biology. So there, there, there's a real belief that there is some sort of interaction between P27 and the environmental variables as they affect program cell death. This is what always happens to me. I, I think I'd like to hear from everybody else who does, well, Jun Cheng does fu functional principal components analysis. This is what I always see is the eigenvalues omega-1, omega-2, and omega-3. They usually, either the second one or the third one is zero. And, and I, I, uh, Ciprian Cranesiano at Hopkins tells me that he's now using uh, functional principal components with uh, data that have 25 non-trivial principal components. But he can't tell me what it, the, the data are because it's all very secret and hush-hush, and I, I believe him, but I'd love to see data which have many principal, com principal components, and, and it would probably make me change from, from biology. Uh, but there we go. I'm going to use just the first two, even though really only one is really necessary. These, these are what they are. It always seems to be like this. The first one's constant. That's the mean shift, and then there's a, a type of linear trend. Uh, so here we have our model, and we've got T is how old the, the, how old the cell is, and this is the environmental effects. And uh, 
what's interesting, what, what, what in fact is really, really neat, is the function u as a function of how old the cells are and the, the single index. And, well, I mean, I just think you need to look, you can look at it. These are baby cells. There's, um, there's a lot more apoptosis at the bottom. In general, there's more apoptosis at the bottom. So when T is small, it's generally true that, the, that, that uh, there's more apoptosis. So that, that component here, the main effect, if you will, and the main effect over there too, is, is something that you expect. But you see this interaction here in the middle, which is where um, the single index model has the, the, the biggest effect. And that's a really unusual shape there. It's saying something about that there's, there's some sort of massive interaction uh, between the, the P27 levels and uh, the environmental variables. Uh, of course, this is a, one great thing about these surface plots is they don't carry variability bars with them. And as Joel was pointing out yesterday, when you start estimating things non-parametrically, some of these confidence intervals can get quite large. And, and, and I'm not actually being all that non-parametric here. I'm being a tiny bit non-parametric, but this is basically a two, well, one-dimensional non-parametric regression uh, surface, or maybe a two-dimensional non-parametric regression. You have scale. Hmm? You have better, you have scale. Yeah, oh yeah, and even better, I don't have scales. No, that's true, but uh, yeah, I, uh, that, these are the scales of apoptosis, at the apoptotic index. The apoptotic index tends to range, at the top of the crypt, it, it tends to be very, very small. It's, a, it's a, like a 3% rate of apoptosis. At the bottom of the crypt, it's more like a 15% rate of apoptosis. So that's really what the scale is. And it doesn't seem like it's much, but it, it is a lot. I'm basically, uh, the, 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 bo the, the rat's body kills off the baby cells that are damaged, and, and that's, 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 pretty, that's good. Um, there's more damage at the, for the baby cells, too. Um, the, the main effects were dominated by uh, 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 dominated by a, um, uh, uh, the, the fish oil diet. This is quite this is incorrect. Mostly, the main effects were about the fish oil diet. They're, the two diets are interesting. One is a good, healthy diet. Uh, we had sam some of us had salmon last night. And the other is the, a corn oil diet, which I like to think of as the typical American potato chip diet. And um, so the corn oil that diet is not a good diet. Um, when uh, the, the interaction parameter was uh, highly significantly affected by the butyrate exposure and, the and how much proliferation there was. Uh, so the, 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 the main effect C transpose beta is the diet, fish oil diet effect, and the other is the, the other two environmental variables. If I ignored the interaction and just fit a, a single, uh, and just fit a partially linear model, nothing was statistically significant. And that's just, it's just uh, implausible. It just can't happen that there's nothing going on in these data. Uh, for one thing, they spent on this little experiment $700,000, so there better have been. Uh, after you paid for all the graduate students, um, there better have been a statistically significant effect, or I would not be be on their grant anymore. Um, but uh, it, there, there are some indica other indications that these that there is really an interaction. I, I I can do a bunch of these little simple simple things, which sometimes are good to do. Um, if it's constant, if the if the uh, the single index function is constant and there's actually no interaction, then there shouldn't be a relationship between the principal component scores and that function. And so I split up the function, the estimated function, into three groups of high, medium, and, and low values. And then I split up the principal component scores into high and low. And, and plotted them. And this is, again, a picture without standard error bars, but it's highly suggestive. The black and the red are the first principal components, and they, they look to have some sort of a cross. The blue and the green are the second principal component. The second principal component's somewhat less crucial, but uh, it, it certainly there looks like there might be something going on there. That's not a statistical analysis, unfortunately. And so the other thing we did was to borrow from 
from uh, some fabulous work that Jun Cheng did a few years ago. And this is a sort of the, the, uh, the poor person's, poor American's version of, what, of the, what did you call it? The um, uh, Wilkes phenomenon. Um, basically, what we did is we generated data from the null model. So we took our, it's, it's a type of parametric bootstrap. We generated data from the null model that there's no interaction. We generated the W's to add noise uh, uh, and, and um, it's from the observed data, so we, we tried to add some noise. We did a little bit more uh, uh, formal tests, but basically we generated data from the null model with the, uh, uh, the, the distributions of x attached and, and then look to see what happened with the likelihood. And this is not a very good explanation of it, but it's pretty much basically the idea. And so we, we each generated data set, we computed the likelihood ratio statistic with and without the interaction. And it, it's, if you will, it's a parametric bootstrap under the null model. We compared it to the likelihood ratio statistic for the data, and the p-value is 0.005 or so, uh, 200 simulated data set, so it was the bottom one. So um, at least there's some, there's some indication that there is a, an interaction, the single index is, is in these data. Okay, so I, I want to finish with a discussion and then the, the picture gallery. Um, the, the main thing that's new here is the addition of an interaction into these principal component type problems or single index type problems. Uh, the, if the basis functions are known, it's, it's very, very, it's, um, it's the model that's new, the basis functions are known, there's, it, it's, you can just start reading off things and you can get a semi-parametric efficient estimator. Uh, we, we talked about how estimating the basis functions can lead to an, an increase in variability. It seems to be uh, entirely in the in uh, the alphas, which is what we'd expect by intuition. And uh, the method with principal component estimation, even if I say there are only three principal components and I fix it, there is the open question as to whether this particular procedure is efficient. And I, my conjecture is it's not efficient. It's efficient computationally, but it's probably not efficient uh, in a semi-parametric sense, because I've estimated the principal components by an outside calculation, so there's no profiling over the principal components. So it's probably not efficient, but I don't know if it is or not. Um, I, I, uh, I, I pointed out before that, that uh, people who, Bayesians, and I'm a Bayesian about half of my life now, uh, want to do this stuff, but they're, they're faced with the, the problem of estimating the principal component functions and, the, and uh, uh, they, they, that problem hasn't been solved in the Bayesian world yet. And, and uh, this part of the reason for undertaking this is we saw papers on this and thought, well, gee, maybe we should work out what happens. Um, whether it proves to be an important issue in practice or not is, is uh, unclear in our particular example. We did some bootstraps and we uh, did and uh, in, in our particular example we did some bootstraps and, and uh, looked at the variances and looked at the variances as to what they should be under the, uh, the, the case of principal components scores and basis functions fixed and known. And there wasn't a big difference but there was a difference again in the alpha. It's not as big as in the simulation. So thanks very much. It's great to be back. Uh, 
Well, no, there's no guarantee you're on the right hill. Uh, we, we did different starting values uh, in our simulations, in our data analysis, and got the same answers, but that's not a guarantee of anything. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, actually, initially, there was a lot of problems getting the thing to work. And Yehua, who did the programming, more carefully looked at the optimization issues and, and so the, hit, hit the problem it was with the parameters just going all over the place and you have to use, he used a nice optimizer at the end to, to get it. But yeah, it's, it's a difficult computational problem. Uh, the, the, I, I didn't, I, I sort of briefly mentioned profiling. Uh, anytime you have a semi-parametric problem, the simplest thing to do is to do a profile likelihood. That is, fix beta, estimate the non-parametric, fix the parameters, estimate the non-parametric part. That gives you a function of the parameters, which you then optimize. And, and that's real, it's, it's a little slow, but what, that's actually pretty unstable. Uh, it, and I'm a little, I'm kind of, I, this paper here basically does that, but it doesn't do a maximization, it does a solution of, an esti of the, the same estimating equation. So it's a slightly different approach. To, I, I um, like to see how it actually, the numerics actually work. Seven hundred, seven hundred. Um, they, they don't, they, they actually, um, yeah, and that's what they do. They, well, what, they'll, what they would do in this problem is they would do a simple linear regression of the apoptotic index on P27, average P27. Uh, they do average P27. So they wouldn't even think, first of all, just thinking about a, a functional data analysis approach, they, they can't do, they won't do. They have a scalar apoptotic index. They would take the P27 and they'd average it and then do a simple linear regression. That's the first analysis that they do. The second analysis they do, they have a diet and um, uh, 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 fiber butyrate treatment. They do a two-way analysis of variance. Then uh, the prolifer proliferative index, they'll do a, a simple linear regression. And sometimes they'll do, well, I mean, they won't, but uh, the, the obvious natural thing to do is to do the, the diet effects, diet treatment effects as, as a saturated um, model with a linear component for um, uh, differentiation and a linear component for average P27, and they don't find anything. Uh, there's nothing statistically significant in that model. And, and so, I, we were talking about this, and I mean, I think that's what that's what that's what I did the first thing, and and I, I just know that there has to be interactions between the, these things, and so uh, you know I've done some other analyses, right? I mean, I, I, I don't just convince myself. So there are simple analyses you can do, but uh, it, it, I found it a little essentially unsatisfactory to use the. The, the P27 is as just an average, because I, I do think that these things are controlled by where, where the cells are. And so they're, they're, they're simple, in the simplest case, where you take averages, there are multiplicative interactions between um, the, the butyrate and, and the P27. You can, you can see it a little bit smaller between the proliferation and the P27. So just the multiplicative interactions, they're statistically significant. My function S is, well, it's, 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 um, is the function S monotone? No. And I have that picture, but I don't have it up here. It is, uh, it's effectively quadratic, and what does it do? It, it either goes like that or it goes like that. I've forgotten. But it, it's effectively quadratic. 
Yeah. In the data, it's effectively quadratic. It's what you think of as you fit a non-parametric regression to a quadratic, a kernel regression to a, non, to a quadratic thing. It looks quadratic, and then at the end, it kind of wiggles around, you know? So it's exactly that. Exactly. The main reason of the box is that there must have some scientific need for a single function. I have not heard about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think the thing they're more interested in is the, just that the existence of interactions and, and trying to quantify them is important, uh, especially when their initial analysis didn't find anything. That was, I, I, I actually made, made myself locally famous for bailing out uh, the experiment. I mean, this wasn't really rocket science, but uh, it, it, they, they talk about, I mean, what's interesting about biology mindsets is they know about interactions. They talk about interactions, but they don't know what to do with interactions. And so uh, they really do need statisticians to help them think through and quantify what the interactions are. No, there's not really two samples. So um, there, there's there's uh, 12 rats total split into four groups. So uh, I, I think, for example, the, the, uh, an interesting thing to do would have been to redo the data on the fish oil fed rats. Uh, I, we haven't done that on this, this problem. Um, there's, there's a limited number of observations. And uh, when you're down to six rats, you're, you're not going to find many things going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, uh, right. No, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you get if 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 you fit S as quadratic, so you just assume S is quadratic, then you get uh, you, you get a U of t and the and the single index. It looks quite similar to that beautiful picture I had. Okay, that beautiful picture I had has a little smoothing involved in it to make it a, a little more beautiful. Because you know how functions are, non-parametric functions are, they wiggle. So I've removed a lot of the wiggling. So I did a smooth of the, the fit. And, and when you do fit a parametric model, you get much the same picture. I mean, qualitatively, quantitatively, the same, same picture. I, I really do think that it's, it's effectively quadratic. And, uh, it's effectively controlled by the fiber butyrate and uh, the the, um, the differentiation, the proliferation index. So, I mean, it, it looks like it. It, it kind of looks like that. It's really kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, you said you didn't have a confidence band, but do you have any feeling for how likely it would be? I mean, just uh, these nice uh, valleys and things would be functional. Yeah. Um, you know, you can reproduce the valley. It, that, so we, we bootstrap things, and we fit parametric bootstraps, and you can reproduce that valley. You see the valley showing up. There, there is some fungibility. There is some movement in, 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 in the thing. Uh, it's, it's actually a good question. How would you show that there really is a valley? And uh, well, maybe that gives me. I'll have to find a graduate student to attack that problem. So I don't. I don't know. Uh, um, 
I was more, I, I guess it's, it's the trouble when you get too involved in a particular example is you think, what I wanted to show was there was some interactions and um, that, 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 and the form of the function had some nice simple form and didn't actually say, ask the question, is there really a valley there? So yeah, it'd be, I think it'd be fun to look at.